Hello. Welcome back. We're back. Welcome back to Rootstock. We're so excited. The second live stream of the day. We've just had lunch. I hope you've had lunch. And now we are going to be talking and hearing from more awesome plant scientists. Yeah, we're also, uh, we're joined now, just as we start this live stream um, by Gareth Steed. Uh, Gareth works uh, for a company called uh, Innovia, um, and he is an innovation consultant. Um, and we're also going to be having some more of our videos a bit later on, but first we're going to have a chat with Gareth. Gareth, you were at Rootstock in the summer um, as one of our career speakers. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us. Thank you um, for having me. Fantastic. Um, can you tell us a bit uh, about what your involvement with the Rootstock event was? Um, yeah, so I came to Rootstock really to talk about uh, my time doing plant science research and also the fact that I was now in a, a different position that was outside directly of plant sciences, although we still do some work um, related to food security. So I did a presentation briefly about my sort of windy career history uh, and then had a really good um, set of small group discussions with students uh, to talk about their projects and also for them to ask uh, more specific detailed career questions. So that's really awesome and I think what's amazing about your career pathway is that you started off in plant science and you <laughs> recognised the broad application of it wider. So I guess can we start off, can we hear a little bit about the research that you were doing and then we'll go on into your career if that's cool? Yeah, of course. So um, I came to Cambridge in 2015 to do a, a PhD, which then led into a, a postdoc in the Department of Plant Sciences, where I was looking at the relationship between photosynthesis, that major plant process, and the circadian clock, which is something I'm very interested in, um, in wheat. Uh, so that very important food crop where we were particularly interested in if there were versions of alleles of circadian clock genes that were interacting with and perhaps regulating photosynthesis in some way. Um, and then, yeah, that sort of led on to postdoc to carry on doing that work and also to look in the model organism Arabidopsis at a specific uh, signaling pathway to the uh, circadian clock via sucrose, which is the major product of photosynthesis. I may, sorry, I was, so I'm curious, why should we care about the circadian rhythm in wheat? Can we improve wheat if we... D d and, and what is the circadian yeah, yeah. clock as well okay. for, our, for our viewers on YouTube? So the circadian clock is an internal timing mechanism. We have a circadian clock. That's why um, we wake up in the morning without an alarm clock. We get tired and why we get jet lag when we um, you know, fly to, to places far, far away. Um, it's a genetic circuit, really, an interlocking transcription translation feedback loop. In us humans, it's really the center of that is located in the brain. But plants also have the same thing, which allows them to preempt dawn and dusk. Um, and I think where that ties into photosynthesis and, and plants is that see, the sun rises in the morning and sets in the evening, but the intensity of sunlight changes quite a lot across the course of the day. And so you, can you prime photosynthesis potentially to be you know, that bit more ready in the morning to make more use of those early photons? Um, and so we were looking at ways, were there circadian clock genes that were specifically related to some photosynthetic traits and yield traits as well? Because the thing about improving crops, you, you're always looking for versions of a gene, so alleles that might confer you an advantage. And it doesn't have to be very big to make a big difference in the field when you're growing wheat across millions of hectares of land. Um, Amazing. I, I, like, I like the phrase early photons. That's a good band yeah. name. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, so, oh, so then, I guess, so going from circadian rhythms and wheat, and now you're an innovation consultant. So could you talk to us a little bit about that pathway? Yes, so perhaps not the most obvious or natural pathway. Um, for me, and I guess that's something for, for students at home, you, when you go into the world of work, there's sort of three facets of that work, and we call it at Anovia the three Fs. So fun, fulfillment, and finance as well are important things. And I think my own, and this is something to keep in mind that people don't always talk about, my own personal situation, I had a small baby. Um, you've then got that consideration of, well, I need something that's maybe a little bit more secure than the contract work of postdocking. Can I find something local that would be very flexible to allow me to have time with my baby? Um, and that was one of the things that led me to apply to different jobs. And then it was purely by chance that someone said to me, have a look at this company. They do interesting work where you'd be able to use um, some of the skills where, 
I think anyone that's doing plant science, you get that really broad range of research skills. And if you're doing science communication, the ability to explain that as well. Um, this might be somewhere where you could use those skills and your scientific problem solving to have a bit of fun at work, but also to have the, the security that I, that I was after. So that was really, it, as with much of my career history, just chance conversation um, that then led me to Anovia, where I've been since March. Yeah, we thank you very much. We were saying earlier in the, the previous live stream, we were talking about, um, we talked about it with Tatum, taking the opportunities um and and those things those things that come up to you in exploring those different avenues and i think you make a really good point uh there gareth about making choices in your career um you know some of those choices we make for reasons that are not are not work reasons um and you're talking about your family life and about your home life or it might be for financial reasons or you might have other people uh you know other people to care for um or thing, or indeed for your, you know taking care of your your own well being. Mm. Those things are really important in those those career deci decisions mm. as well. So thank you for for drawing on that. And I think also the three F's is really crucial: that fun, fulfilment, and finance. And I think too often when it comes to looking at different careers, that overarching element is is the finance. Mm. And I think making sure that you've got those other those other crucial two of them yeah. um, I think is really important and the balance might be different for different people as to, to where you you know want to put your mm. energies and different for you at different people at different times in your life so um, lots for uh, people to be people making careers decisions to be thinking about um, yeah. Gareth I was just gonna you said you worked on some some really fun uh, projects um, I mean, specifically thinking about plant science, if you can. Um, yeah. But um, if you could uh, tell us, what have you been innovating and consulting on? <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, I can't tell you the complete details because it's secret. Um, but uh, so we do, like, it's a, it's a wide range of problems. But I think a big thing at the moment um, that's really good for those that are interested in doing plant science is the move and the realisation that we have a food security issue. Um, and that's a problem for... So in the academic sense, you know, looking at well, how are we going to have these varieties of crops that can withstand more water stress or can make better use of nitrates within the soil. Um, and now I'm more looking at it from the commercial side. So if you're a massive manufacturer of food, it's really important if you're baking, for example, that the quality of the wheat, or like if you're using wheat flour, is consistent. So what can you do as a, a company to both look at different varieties, different ways of growing, different partnerships with your suppliers to ensure that you as the, a, a company are producing consistent product for consumers, which we all expect when we go to the supermarket and buy something, usually if it's sort of packaged up. So now a little bit more around that side of things, but there is also a big buzz at the moment in the vertical farming world. And so thinking about you know, what's the best way to, you know, what should you be growing? How should you be growing? You've got far more control over um, conditions with vertical farming. So I think that's also, a, you know, an area that's creating a buzz at the moment for good reason, where there's a big scope, not just for academics to be doing research, but for those in industry to be interested as well. Fantastic. Could you, just for the viewers, could you explain in a little bit more detail what vertical farming is? Yeah, so vertical farming is, if we think of, so, Traditional farming is very much horizontal farming. Everything is on the ground um, or maybe in trees if, you, if you've got an orchard, but generally on the ground. Vertical farming is about rather than growing on the ground, growing things on walls or in stacks indoors. So it's particularly good for crops that don't require tons of spaces. Something like wheat, if you want to get a decent yield to make a bag of flour, you do need quite a lot of space. Um, but some, for, uh, it's been very common and used for quite some time actually with like salad crops indoors where they're quite sensitive to weather, they grow over a sh short period of time to the point at which you get the crop that you want to use. And so then growing them indoors under specific um, wavelengths of light, which can possibly, well, can alter the flavor of them as well to make them more appealing to consumers, giving you a more consistent product, reducing your use of water as well, um, because there's different ways that you can sort of water the roots of plants. Um, yeah, so that's vertical farming. It's basically indoor growing like a greenhouse, but you're using artificial LED light most of the time in big stacks. And th these buildings can be very high as well, but therefore making a very good use of space. And also means that you could be growing them in the middle of a city, um, which you, you couldn't be growing a field of wheat in the middle of a city. Oh, fantastic. So I think one of the things 
that I first discovered about you was that you were previously a science teacher. <laughs> yes. and, I fe- <laughs> and I feel that you've definitely got these, these communication skills and the ability to kind of give across science to lots of different stakeholders. And I'm curious as to how that ability to communicate science has really helped in your current role uh, as a consultant, where I imagine you've got to talk to lots of different stakeholders. Yeah, that, yes, spot on. So, yes, that was, I think, the first time we met, we spoke about teaching. Um, yeah, I think it's really, re- I, I didn't realise quite how important it was or how valuable a skill it was, because I think when you're teaching or even at the university, many people are good at communication. Um, but now it's really important to be able to explain science to stakeholders that they might be a technical expert or an engineer. So they're going to want something on one level. And then you might talk to people in marketing or the consumer side of a business and their base level of science obviously isn't as high. They've got other, they know a lot about other things I have no idea about. So then it's about how you break down the information in a way that they'll understand quickly and succinctly without giving lots of background, but still getting your point across. Um, And I think that that's the kind of thing when you're teaching, especially which you'd know yourself, Russell, um, you do all the time without thinking about it. It's when you're in a different role um, like this, where you know the, the, often the client is looking for you to give good, solid advice that's backed by science in a way that they understand. So part of the thing that you're selling to them is your ability to communicate the results of the work that you do. So I think it's actually really fundamental. Yeah, and I think what you you touched on there, uh, Gareth, is like is that working with different audiences and understanding what their needs are and and what what are they going to be most interested in you know what are those points that you you really want to get across to them um and that are going to be most value valuable i suppose no definitely um and so i'm curious then uh if you've got any uh career advice for our Mm. viewers um a a nugget that they can take away to help them further their their careers into wherever they might be going Mm, okay yeah so Maybe more than one nugget. So I think my first nugget would be like, don't worry too much about the really long term because life and situations change over time. So always be make the best decision you can at the time, but don't look back and worry that you've made the wrong decision because that was the right decision at the time. And likewise, don't pl- try not to plan too far ahead. Some people you meet in life always, they're like, I've always wanted to be a fireman. I want to be a fireman from the age of one. And that's what they do their whole career. But actually most people aren't that's not their career journey. So I think it's about picking the thing that you're you're really interested in. I think that makes a huge difference, especially if going down the science route, I think you have to be interested. Um, don't just do things because you think, well, I've got nothing else to do, nothing better to do. Like really think, what would you enjoy? Um, and yeah, that would be the thing I've learned so far. There's absolutely no way if you'd asked me 15 years ago, what will you be doing now that I would have said this? And even if you'd asked me three years ago, there's no way I would have said this. So. Yeah, things change um, and that's a good thing. So don't worry too much. Just make the best decision you can in the present. Yeah, absolutely. And I I used to run um, careers workshops in schools quite a lot. And one of the things I used to say was when I was your age, I didn't know that this that my job that I'm doing now even existed. Um, And I think that's that's even more true as more and more jobs get created and different types of work. Um, there's so many things um, that people watching this YouTube channel will end up doing that, in <laughs> fact, indeed, none of us have ever heard of at this point. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think thank you so much for joining us, Gareth. That's been absolutely fantastic. Um, and thank you again for joining us at Rootstock uh, in July. It was July, wasn't it? It was July. It was July. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, we're going to um, say goodbye to Gareth now and move on to our first student video of the second half of Rootstock. Thank you very much, Gareth. Um, so we are now moving on to our video, um, which was made by Phoebe Hinton, um, by Olivia Frangzak, Tegan Duff, Izzy Watts and Faye Pontramoli. Um, so quite a team. Um, this is all about why you should do plant science. There's also, afterwards, um, we've got Phoebe Hinton, who's studying biological sciences at Cardiff University. Uh, She is going to be commenting, there's a short video commenting um, on on the the video, Why Do Plant Science, just straight afterwards. Um, So we'll see you after that. Don't forget to ask questions in the chat. 
Um, the bottom. Please, yeah, add them in um, and we can bring, bring them up on the screen and we'll try and answer them the best we can. So, let's find out. Why, why do plant science? Why do plant science? Why should we do plant science? Let's find out. Only a handful of UK universities offer a course solely focused on plant science. This is really concerning because plants are the future. Plants are important for many reasons, including access to healthy food, medicines, access to green spaces, they produce oxygen, they give animals a home, and they're used in cooking, and lots more. I did plant science because once I scraped my knee as a kid, my nan told me to hug a willow tree. Having disregarded it, it wasn't until later I learned willow bark contained the active agent in aspirin. Plants suddenly became very cool. When I was younger, I was in the Scouts, and this meant spending lots of time outdoors. I think other young people should be able to have these sorts of opportunities too. Living near a farm, I've always enjoyed growing my own fruit and vegetables for cooking. This has helped me appreciate how important plants are for feeding the world. My fourth grade teacher inspired my love for growing house plants. She gifted me a small spider plant cutting. Propagating planting and caring for plants is engaging and teaches children to care, and it shows them they're more than just a decoration. Plants have significance to everyone, you just don't know it yet. Hi, my name is Phoebe Hinton and I'm a second year biological science student at Cardiff University. Uh, so I don't really remember where my passion for plants started, however I've always had houseplants and my mum's always had houseplants so I feel as if I have grown up around plants. I have quite a few houseplants at home uh, but I wasn't able to bring them to uni because they really don't like how cold my second year house is which is very disappointing. <laughs> so I decided to apply to rootstock because Although I'd met people on my course, I felt as if I hadn't met anyone who was as passionate about plants as I was. So it was really nice to spend three days in rootstock with people who were so passionate about plants and even about parts of plants I didn't know you could be passionate about. Uh, I also really enjoyed um, listening to stories from people who were researchers and had professions in plant science so I could see where my passion could take me uh, after my degree. So we decided to do our video, uh, as you've just seen, on um, why study plant science. I think we chose to do that topic because it was a nice summary of what we'd learn uh, over the few days at Rootstock about why communication, communicating science sorry, is so important. And I just think in my high school, I know, like, there was such a small section on plant science. It wasn't enough to really fuel people's passions on it. Um, I think there should be such a bigger focus in high school, even in primary school. Uh, just there should be more people who are passionate about it and who can really make people enjoy it at an earlier age. So the passions can really develop. Uh, I think that's really important for the future because we, we depend on plants for everything, for food, for the air we breathe. It's important for our survival. Fantastic, really impassioned plea there. Um, just kind of explaining what Rootstock was about. So we thought we'd just, maybe it would be useful to explain to you guys actually what Rootstock was and what it entailed. Um, so Gatsby Plant Science Education Programme traditionally have run a school called the Gatsby Plant Science Summer School. And the idea behind that is to immerse biology undergrads in the wonderful world of plant science with a view of being like, what, plant science? I didn't know that was a thing. Now I love plant science and I'm gonna go into plant science research. The problem is, well not really a problem, the awesome thing is that there are people at university who already love plants. So we wanted to support them in becoming plant science champions within their cohorts at their universities and basically fly the flag for plant science and help them speak to their peers uh, and really just get excited and spread the plant love as much as possible. So this is what we tried to do. And how did we do it, Alex? What did we do at Rootstock? Well, we had um, just under 40 students join us here at the Sainsbury Laboratory in Cambridge. Um, and they came here for, for three days um, and we collaborated with Siren Calling to deliver sessions um, on how to communicate plant or how to communicate any science or any sort of communication. Uh, we thought about different audiences, we thought that 
asked them to think about bringing something personal into their communication. Um, so they explored that. Uh, and they also got some uh, information from people like Gareth, who we heard from a moment ago, uh, about uh, different career options. So they're already interested in plants. Um, and so what careers might they want to go on to do? And then they spent a lot of time making the videos that you're watching today. Um, they made the, they'd make them um, and do different iterations and go through and, and building on adding those bits of um, that they learnt about in each session and gradually refining them to produce the amazing mm. videos that you see today. So these videos were produced really over, it was two half days and a, a full day in the middle. Um, so they, they did a lot of work um, and achieved a lot um, in that time. Uh, and you'll be hearing, um, just as we heard from Phoebe there, um, about, about their experiences. And right at the end of this live stream, we've got a fantastic uh, feedback from one of our from one of the students who came um, explaining why she felt that rootstock was the best thing ever so uh, stay tuned clearly, for that. clearly it is I mean I think one of the other awesome things about rootstock is it happened here inside the Cambridge laboratory sorry the same field laboratory at Cambridge University which is a center of plant science excellence and so as well as the undergrads we were also uh, in here with some of actual plant scientists who are researching within the building and it was really nice to see the scientists learn from the students and the students learn from the scientists. They also had access to the facilities here so they got to have a tour of the university herbarium, of the micro, uh, microscopy suite at the, at the growing facilities there but also have a guided tour of the amazing Cambridge University Botanic Garden so it really was immersive and we were really keen to replicate that immersion that you get also from this summer school. Yeah absolutely and we mustn't forget that we've got uh, videos from some of the researchers who took part as well uh, so we've we saw a couple of those in the first half um, and we've got more to come uh, in this second half. And we've actually got two actual scientists who took part in the Rootstock. They became awesome at making videos and science communication. We're going to show their video and we're going to interview them um, shortly. So I'm looking forward to meeting Ewan and uh, Mawish. Fantastic. Now, we are on to another video. Um, this video is not a Rootstock video. It comes instead from one of our partners, the Royal Society of Biology, or the RSB. Uh, the RSB are a membership organisation for biologists and bioscience enthusiasts the world over. Um, and they now have, uh, they have an A to Z of the Biosciences video series on YouTube. Um, so we're going to listen to one of those. We've got, this video is from Jacob Asman and it features, he's an early career scientist uh, looking at plants in a rather unusual location. I so wonder what, about that. where will that be? <laughs> Where will he find these plants? Let's find out. My name is Jakob Asman and I'm a researcher working at the University of Aarhus. My research is about the Arctic. The Arctic in the very north of our planet is warming more than twice the rate than the rest of the globe. And I'm particularly curious about how this is affecting the plants that live up there. This research will give us a better idea of how the Arctic could look like in 20 or 30 years to come and what that might mean for the rest of our planet. My colleagues and I are using drone and satellite imagery as well as on the ground observations to find out exactly how the plants are changing in this remote region. When I'm in the office, I usually start my day writing emails or meeting colleagues to make plans for new research projects or to solve problems and discuss ideas. When I'm in the field, things will look very differently. We're often very far away from any human settlements, so we'll be sleeping in tents or small cabins. We'll make our breakfast on a camping stove before heading out into the tundra. There, we'll fly drones, count plants using pen and notebook, or we'll measure them with calipers and measurement tape. A lot of exciting things happen when we are out on the tundra. We always have to be careful and look out for polar and grizzly bears, but it's great to see them when you can see them safely. The tundra itself is beautiful, particularly in the golden light of the midnight sun. And we are never far away from the sea, so we often see whales. And if we're really lucky, we'll catch the northern lights at the very end of the summer. 
I worked on organic farms after high school, which probably woke my interest into the natural world. I then studied a bit of physics and mathematics before changing to a degree in ecology at the University of Edinburgh. Afterwards, I joined a doctoral training program and since my graduation from that, I've been working at different universities around the world. My advice for a young person would be to be curious and try out as many things as you would like. Only that way you can find something that you really enjoy. And if you're interested into the natural world like I am, then a university degree in biology or ecology can be a great thing. Awesome video there. Um, who'd have thought being a plant scientist could take you to such amazing and exciting spaces around the planet. Yeah, amazing. And so do take a look, not right now because you're watching Rootstock, but do take a look at the Royal Society of Biology's YouTube channel where you can find more of the A to Z of biosciences videos uh, up there. Um, I think there's one of me coming up at some Is point. There? I just don't think it's going to be as good as, as Jakob's though. Why not? So... Do you not have pictures of whales and polar bears in yours? Yeah, no, there aren't unfortunately, but they're not plants, are they? So that's all right. Um... <laughs> They aren't. We must mention um, that the Royal Society of Biology also um, run the Plant Health Undergraduate Studentships um, and we'll put a link uh, to find out more about those. Um, yeah, all along there. underneath. There. Uh, just, yeah, just there. Thank you, Russell. Um, when, when we post the recorded stream. So um, you, can, you can search that as well, but do, um, you'll find that in the... Uh, once we've posted the recording. Um, right, on to uh, our, our next, next video. video. Next video. This one is called Green Cities. Green yep. Cities, yeah, yep. absolutely. And it's by Sophie Allard and Alania Lapina. Green Cities, let's find out about why we should make our cities greener. We've got a recorded statement from uh, Sophie just beforehand as well. Yeah, so let's to find out a little bit more about her experience at Rootstock, um, we'll have that recorded statement. And then we've got... Green Cities! Who doesn't like green cities? Hi there, my name is Sophie and I'm a current second year student at the University of Lancaster studying natural sciences. I was a part of Rootstock this summer and me and my partner Eleni made the documentary that you're about to watch called Green Cities. Now, I got into plant science the same way I'm sure some of you can relate to, which is by being dragged on long, rolling walks every weekend by my parents out in the countryside. Um, of course, now I thank them for it. But the more time I spent in the countryside, the more I found my city to be lacking. Um, just the monochromatic grey, it made me sad. And so I really wanted to go into a field of study where I can remedy this. So this is explained a bit more in our video, but the basic concept of our video is making our cities more green and collaborating with environmental architects and city planners to make green canopies, natural living walls and other things that can make our cities just a better, brighter place. As well as this, it'll help bring wildlife into the cities and also really improve people's mental health because I'm sure a lot of people would much rather walk through a park or along a water feature than down the street. So I really hope you enjoy our documentary. On top of this, I really do believe it's a really, really important topic for people like us, people like you, who are just getting into plant science to look into because it's a really under-researched area. Next year, I'm hoping to do a study abroad placement in Boulder, Colorado, because they offer environmental architecture courses there. And then hopefully in the future, with the help of Gatsby, go on to study this field further. Hopefully you guys will join me and see that plant science is actually such a broad and interesting field. I mean, I thought it would be boring, and here I am. So I implore you to look into it further because there are really so, so many possibilities. So again, I hope you enjoy our video. Even though it's a little bit silly, we believe the premise still stands, and I hope you enjoy the rest of this conference. Thank you. This is what happens when urbanization wipes out green spaces. Plant scientists cry. Monocultures wipe out biodiversity and imagination. Rising global temperatures cause plants to grow in places where they simply do not belong. They can adapt, like lavender growing over these heat vents. But at what cost? Shouldn't we be the ones to help them? Thankfully, we can help. 
Rewilding in places such as these meadows provide the possibility of more biodiversity as well as reducing flood risk. Incorporating living walls into architecture provides insulation and cools the surrounding area. Plants such as these are able to grow indoors through the usage of skylights and floor length windows. Natural lighting reduces energy consumption as well as boosting people's productivity. Implementing these strategies in the future provides climate security, CO2 reduction, and more biodiversity, promoting more active and happy people. Seconds. Fantastic. Uh, really good fun video there, highlighting uh, how important the green is within our quite often grey urban environment. And I'm sure anyone during lockdown who was desperate to get out, walk around and see and interact with natural spaces. I was living in London and luckily I was near Victoria Park, uh, but it was actually quite difficult to engage with the natural environment during that time. So I think hopefully post lockdown, every cloud has a silver lining. I'm hoping that people now have a bit more of an appreciation of the wonder of the natural world and the importance of plants uh, within urban spaces. Yeah, absolutely. And we're, re we're really lucky here um, to be right next to the University of Cambridge Botanic Garden. Um, so some of those images that you saw there where they were looking at the, those really biodiverse meadows, those were at the Botanic Garden. So just want to say again, thank you to them for uh, letting us use their space. Um, so you're saying that people should come and definitely check out the garden because it's awesome to look at. Absolutely, they should definitely come and visit uh, the University of Cambridge Botanic Garden. Um, absolutely, yes. One of, the right. things, one of the things which really blew me away, because I'd worked here for a year until I discovered it, that's how big the garden is, is the winter garden. Mm. And at this time of year, where you think, oh, everything's a bit dead and it's a bit grey, they've specifically chosen plants which are vibrant colours that grow at winter time, and you walk into it, and you're just like, whoa, and it's just such an amazing feeling at this time when it tends to get darker and colder and we tend to be a bit more inside a bit more. Heading out to the Winter Garden and seeing that is a phenomenal experience, so definitely pop down. Yeah, absolutely. I went there at lunchtime today, in fact. I sat here in the studio all morning, popped out to the Winter Garden. Um, we do have a quick question on the screen. Um, do plants come from the Sainsbury Laboratory at the University of Cambridge? You think Ooh. they might know the answer to this question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do plant scientists take inspiration from their surroundings or do they spend all day in the lab? Interesting. Well, what I thought, what you could see from that video that we just watched is so the Sainsbury Lab has been specifically designed. So when you're in the laboratory, it's all natural light and you can work at your lab station and then you can go, why am I doing this? For what reason am I doing this? Then you look and you can see the plants out the window and you can be like, that's why I'm doing it, for the plants outside the window. So that's great. So it's really nice to have this building that's been thought through in terms of not only making sure it's a nice space to work, but also making sure that the researchers remember their, their tie to the plants and the outside yeah, world. Even when there are those times when people have to spend all day in the lab or all day at the computer, um, hopefully there's also time to be inspired by the natural world as well. And these are real world problems that people are, are looking at solving. So they are inspired by the real world Definitely. in that way. And so one of the things that happens, uh, and what a lot of the work that we do, that they do here in the lab, is all themed around the genetics of mm -hmm. things. And this has always been a little bit of a contentious subject when you start talking about genetic modification of crops and things like that. But fundamentally, it could, well, it definitely does hold the solution to so many of the world's problems. So we've got a couple of videos next which are going to be exploring uh, myth-busting this idea behind genetic modification and design of genes and actually what this means for research and for the future of humanity. What if I told you that this plant was genetically modified? And this one. And even this one. Lots of people find the idea of genetic modification really scary, but we've been doing the same thing for years just by choosing the biggest or the best crop to regrow when we're farming. The idea of genetic modification in modern science is basically the same thing, just sped up and a lot more precise. 
think of genes as like the instructions for making any living thing. Scientists can now go into those instructions and make tiny changes to improve the traits of those living things. This could be making a plant more resistant to pests or making it produce more food. Genetically modified crops help farmers make enough food to feed everyone, using fewer chemicals to kill pests and reducing our impact on the environment. Genetic modification is just a tool that, when used correctly, can help us improve food security and quality and make sure we've got enough food available for everyone in the world. Everybody needs food. Food insecurity is when some people in the world do not have access to enough food to be healthy. Food insecurity can occur anywhere in the world and is often caused by poverty, which means being extremely poor or unemployment, not having a paid job or low income. Crops are fundamental to food production. Maize, rice and wheat are examples of leading food crops. And humans have been farming them for ages, but recently they are under threat from diseases, climate change, which is Earth's temperature increasing due to human activity, and population increase. Because of that, we need more crops quickly to feed more people. We will need to increase crop production by 50% by 2050. Unfortunately, traditional ways are not good enough. Luckily, we can modify their genes, that's what tells the plant what it is, to make better plants. An example would be golden rice, which can be made to be larger and more vitamin rich. These de designer crops are healthier, feed more people, and are stronger against climate change. Fantastic videos about uh, genetic modification there, busting some myths. Um, we should say the first one, uh, Mythbusters 1, genetic modification, uh, that was put together by Jamie Morass, Anna Basford and Reem Al-Hassan. And the second video was by Emily Katz, Thomas Hughes, uh, Yongji and uh, Daniel Cairns. So uh, really good videos there. And I think there's always this temptation with implant science to be like, oh, I don't want to talk about the GM thing because it's so oh, such a hot topic. But I think... And there's also this weird idea that permeates is that scientists are doing it to be, like, do some kind of like weird Jurassic Park thing, or I, I don't know. And that, but fundamentally, the thing that's driving it is trying to feed people and trying to reduce environmental devastation. We've got climate change, so trying to make crops which are flood resistant and drought resistant is quite useful. Trying to make crops that have higher yields and higher calorie and nutritional content means we don't have to use as much space for agriculture, which means we don't have to cut down things. Um, there's so many reasons to do it. You know, th there are even some amazing research trying to put denitrifying bacteria from legumous um, plants that have those in their roots into the roots of normal uh, plants that don't have those. So plants can literally grow their own fertilizer, make their own fertilizer from the nitrogen in the air, which means we don't have to put fertilizer all over the fields, which not only saves loads of money, but then that doesn't get washed into the ocean and cause harmful algal blooms and eutrophication. So there's so many reasons why we should be doing this. And um, please don't be scared of it. So thank <laughs> you for those videos. I'll get off my soapbox now. No, not at all, Russell. There are, and there are lots, there's lots of information about uh, genetic modification out there. So uh, do, if, you know, if you're interested, go out and find more, find out more. Um, you can find out also what the things that people are doing um, to, or the, th the controls that are in place to make sure that things that could be, that could be negative outcomes, that they've been thought about, um, and that those things, uh, that we protect against those, um, and that that, so genes, we don't spread genes all the way through the environment when they're just meant to be in one crop, for example. Well, fortunately, oh, Jamie says, uh, thank you for the comment, Jamie, says greenery should be a major consideration within any urban planning. Thanks, Absolutely. Jamie. I totally concur. If only more governments and councils had read that comment. <laughs> there we go. Now, uh, what we are lucky enough to have is someone who is researching genetic techniques in wheat. We have got a Natasha or Tash Brock from Rothamsted Research, I believe, on the line. Hey. Hi, Natasha. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Lovely to meet you. So I understand that you are using a really awesome technique called CRISPR-Cas9 to do something with wheat. Yes. Can you? So we're can trying you talk to, to us. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Sorry, I was going to say, could you talk to us about the amazing work that you're doing? Absolutely, yeah. So we're trying to uh, use this technique, CRISPR-Cas9, to edit wheat to be higher in protein. 
So over 2 billion people globally subsist on wheat for over 20% of their protein and calories. So it's an absolutely essential crop for our global food security. But as we're trying to uh, feed more people with our growing population, we need to make sure our nutrient requirements meet this. And lots of cereals like wheat are low in a particular amino acid called lysine. So what we're trying to do is use this uh, CRISPR-Cas9 to be able to make a small change to the wheat genome so that we're able to uh, produce much higher amounts of lysine in the plant, which is essential uh, in our diets. Um, so we're producing gene edited wheat, not uh, gene modified wheat. Oh, that's an in, yeah, really interesting point there, um, Tash. So you so made the distinction between gene editing and gene modifying. Could you uh, elaborate on that a little bit more, please? Of course, yeah. So this technique, CRISPR-Cas9, that we're using is classified as a, a GM technique because you are able to produce GM plants using it. However, if you remove any transgenes from your plant at the end of the process, meaning there's no DNA left from a different species in your target organism, then there's no risk of these transgenes being transferred into the environment, which is a lot of people's concern about GM. And so if you don't have these transgene in a plant, then the crop is actually classified as gene edited and not GM. Fascinating. And so we've got, we've got an interesting comment here um, from Kathy. Thanks, Kathy, for typing in. It says, I, I think this is actually raises a really interesting point. We normally think of gene editing or crops, GM crops or whatever, at one end of the spectrum, artificial, fake, really nasty, bad for the environment. And then we've got organic farming at the other end, which is, which is super. And I think this makes a point that can the two coexist? Can they work together? Is this something that, yeah, we could explore? Um, I think both, both options are great and both are trying to produce more and, and healthy food for the planet, which is definitely what we need. It's just two quite different approaches to the same problem. So I think it would be great if in the future they can coexist. But at the minute, I think there's not as much understood about uh, gene edited crops. And so there's quite a lot of uh, competition between new gene edited crops and organic farmers. So I think there's definitely a, a conversation and that needs to be had between organic farmers and people producing these new gene edited crops. Oh, really interesting. Thank you. Um, oh, we've got another another question that's uh, that's come in. Um, so, uh, well, maybe we could all try and answer this question, but uh, we might direct it to Tash first. <laughs> um, Tash or oh, Russell, are you ready? Do you want to answer this question? No, no, first? I, let's get Tash to do it first. I, I bet I can guess what Tash's favourite plant is. This is the question. What is your favourite plant and why? I mean, I do study wheat. I think I'm going to have to say the Triticum mavestium, which is bread wheat, is what I work on. It has one of the largest and most complex genomes in, in all of uh, plants and animals and is an amazing organism. That's a pretty good fact. How, how complicated is wheat compared to like the human genome? Yeah, so humans are uh, diploid, but uh, bread wheat is hexaploid, meaning it's got three copies. So it's got three sets of two. So it's like having six genomes. So that means it is uh, absolutely enormous and it has lots of uh, repeated sequences within the plant, which makes it very complicated to study for genetics, but also incredibly interesting. I think that's fascinating because there's this, I think there's this weird idea that humans are like, we are the most complicated mm. and evolved thing on the planet and something as lowly as a plant can't possibly be complicated. And to find out that the genome of something like wheat, which we eat all the time, is actually more complicated is quite phenomenal. Yeah, it's amazing, yeah. really. Um, I would like to ask you, Tash, um, what's your journey been like to, to where you are now? So um, have you always loved plants? Um, or is that something that came a little bit later for you? Do you mean physically or in terms of her career? 
In terms of her career, in terms of her career, okay. I'm not talking about whether you have house plants at home or anything like that. Okay. <laughs> I do also have a large collection of house plants, but um, so I did my undergraduate in biology at the University of York, and I actually had a strong focus on genetics. That's where my initial passion and interest lied. Um, but I did the Gatsby Plant Science Summer School a few years ago, and that was the first time when I realised that plants can make. Uh, such interesting uh, model organisms for a variety of different problems that you could study immunology and development and all these things within plants um, as well as within animals. So that kind of initially opened the door for me. Um, and then I've kind of combined my love of genetics with plant science. And so I chose to do the, the PhD that I'm, I'm currently doing right now, which is the, the gene editing of wheat. Fantastic. What a wonderful advert for the Gatsby Plant Science Summer School. Thank you, Tad. <laughs> that was really good. That was really good. So just, just wrapping up, I got on my soapbox while I was talking that I think we need, to, we need to properly look at this and stop being scared of this. What would you say to someone, you're down the pub, you're having an argument with someone who's massively against GM and gene edited crops. Could you, uh, what would you say to them in res response to that? I think firstly I'd say I understand their concern and I understand why people are worried because of so much uh, negative press in the past but the the great thing about gene edited crops is all these uh, risks of transgenes or in the in the future any sort of long-term negative effects we just don't have the risk of that so gene editing crops provides us with uh, an amazing alternative where we can have all these benefits of uh, high yield, more nutritious and temperature or climate resistant, which is something that we desperately need to be able to feed our massively growing population um, without any of these risks and um, any kind of negative attributes that people are worried about. So I would say just try and learn more about it. You know, attending things like this and, and learning about gene editing crops and some of the amazing things that people have already done in other countries. We've actually been eating gene edited and, and, and GM crops for quite a long time globally. And um, so I think it's, it's time that the UK and the EU sort of caught up with the rest of the world, really. Fantastic. And I've got to say, fundamentally, your work that you're doing can potentially save millions of lives and improve people's lives. What does that feel like working on a project of this magnitude? Yeah, I mean, I mean, when you say it like that, I, I completely agree. It's not necessarily something I think about day to day when I'm just in the lab pipetting out, you know, some seeds and things. Um, but it is amazing to think about the, the impact that your work can have on people and that you are making such a big difference. And, you know, we have one of the first uh, gene edited wheat field trials here at, at Rothamsted, which is focused on, on low acrylamide, which is a carcinogen in, in food products. So that work that we're doing is, you know, directly going to help uh, a lot of people. So it is very gratifying to, to know that that's the, the impact that your work is having. Absolutely fantastic. fantastic. Thank you very much, Tash. Thank you. Um, that's been really, really helpful, really valuable, and I hope everyone on YouTube has uh, enjoyed that. I'll, I'll be honest, Tash kind of makes me want to quit what I do and go study, go study wheat. Uh, <laughs> 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 Thanks ever so much, Thank Tash. Much, Lovely Tash, chatting to you. Bye. Brilliant. So I guess what Tash kind of touched upon at the end there, some of the work that's going on at Rothamsted, is this idea of plant pathogens and uh, things that grow in plants that can either spoil crops or cause uh, crops to have, um, what are they called? Bad things in them, toxins. Toxins, toxins yeah. bad <laughs> things in them. Uh, have got toxins in them. And one such bad plant pathogen is something called rice blast fungus. So we've got a short clip now from the Royal Society of Biology's podcast series. So what this is, this is gonna be an audio track so if you're a bit bored of a screen, this is your time to kind of close your eyes and listen to the sultry tones of uh, Nick Talbot. Or what you could do instead, if you don't want to do that, is type in to an image search, rice blast fungus, and then just stare at the <laughs> image of rice blast fungus while we play this audio clip 
of Nick Talbot. So Nick Talbot is kind of a big deal. He's the director of the Sainsbury Laboratory over in Norwich, which is the sister institution of what we're in. And he has been researching plant pathogens for a long time. So he's like one of the UK, probably world authorities on this. So let's hear a little bit from Nick Talbot uh, talking to us about rice blast fungus. Rice blast disease is one of the most devastating diseases of cultivated rice. So it affects rice wherever it's grown, all, all across the world. And each year it destroys enough rice to feed about 60 million people. So considering that rice supplies about 23% of the world's calories and about 50% of the world depend on it as a staple food, it's really serious. So wherever you get blast disease outbreaks, it can, it can have really significant consequences. So it's, it's of social and humanitarian importance too. So the disease is caused by a fungus, Magnaporpha rhizae, it's a filamentous fungus. So fungi are those organisms that uh, produce strand-like cells called hyphae. They're very good at invading things. So they're obviously familiar to, to many people because they are able to rot the food that we fail to eat, that we leave in our fridges. And people are used to seeing mushrooms and toadstools, so they're used to seeing fungi. But they're also pretty much the most important group of plant pathogens. And this fungus is able to find its way into rice plants. It, it has a very a unique way of entering rice plants, which I can tell you about. But once it's inside a rice plant, then it can grow very, very quickly through living plant tissue, and it can cause disease within three or four days of actually invading a, a rice plant. So, uh, so what are we trying to do? We're trying to understand how does the fungus gain entry to a rice plant? And then once it's inside a rice plant, then uh, how is it able to, uh, to cause the disease symptoms that, uh, that we see? There we go, Nick Talbot there. Stuff. Really, really good uh, to talk, uh, to hear him chat about that. And like I said, the uh, Royal Society of Biology have got loads and loads of other podcasts of plant science experts, biology experts, all kinds of different things, talking about their research and the importance of the research that they do. Absolutely. Um, so do go and have a look at those. Not right now, as I said before, because you're currently watching Rootstock. Um, now, mentioned in that podcast, um, the food that we eat uh, obviously relies a lot on the health of the plants that are growing that food. Um, and we're going to turn that a little bit, turn that statement around. We're going to be thinking about food that is plant based. Um, so thinking about just eating plants uh, and can we get the nutrition that we need from just eating plants? Uh, so this, we've got a video um, from two students uh, in a moment. We've got a video from, St uh, from Stella Moran Rosado and Shaib Islam. Uh, but first, we've got an introduction by Stella, uh, who is studying natural science at Durham University. And she's going to chat to us a bit about her experience at Rootstock. And then we'll head straight into their video, which is called Are Vegans Weedy? Are vegans weedy? <laughs> Sorry, let's play the video. <laughs> Hi, my name's Stella. I'm a second year natural sciences student at Durham University, and I really enjoyed taking part in Rootstock this summer. I'm particularly interested in the intersection of biology and geography and looking into how plant sciences can be used to tackle climate change. There's a number of ways this can be done including using plants as biofuel for carbon sequestration, ecosystem conservation, and even genetically engineering plants to make crops more secure, more resistant to disease, and also increasing their nutritional value. Biofortification is what we chose to look into for our short video, which we made at Rootstock, called Are Vegans Weedy? And we chose to do this because of the pressure of feeding a growing global population and also the increasing popularity of plant-based diets. I've been vegetarian for most of my life, but was moving more towards veganism over the past year to reduce my individual carbon footprint. And I could really relate to some of the common concerns that people share about nutrient deficiency, which often deter people from making the change. An example of this is vitamin B12, which isn't naturally found in plants, but is vital for red blood cell and nerve cell production. So in light of the climate crisis, it's never been more important that we look into ways that 
biotechnology and genetic engineering can be used to help make our diets more sustainable but remaining equally nutritious. Restock was an amazing way to discover more about the potential of plant sciences, but also thinking about the science in a different way, about how we can communicate important messages in an accessible and creative way. But what use is algae to me? Algae is more important than you think. In light of the recent climate crisis, reducing meat consumption and moving towards a plant-based diet is key to reducing our carbon footprint. Oh, but what about my nutrients? I heard plants can't make B12. I could never be vegan. I don't want muscle weakness and fatigue. I feel exactly the same, but cutting-edge research at Cambridge University found an algae which can accumulate B12, supplementing a healthy vegan diet. Oh, wow. But what about that super golden rice I keep hearing about? Exactly. Genetic engineering has helped fortify rice with vitamin A needed for healthy eyes and healthy growth. Now, now we, we can, can eat all the plants we want with all the nutrients we need. Fantastic video there from uh, the Our Vegans Weedy team. Um, I thought they did a really good job of uh, bringing, we talked earlier about, we talked when Rootstock um, about bringing something personal to your communication. Um, and Stella talks there about her, her journey um, from being vegetarian through to becoming vegan and those things that she'd been thinking about. Um, and that clearly fed into her video um, that she developed together with Shaib. I think it's, yeah, it is really, really interesting because, I mean, as, as Stella was just talking about there, you know, the low, massively lower carbon footprint from more plant-based diets. And this is the thing, like, uh, I, I believe COP28 is finished today. Is it? Or, or this week? And one of the main things that came out of that was we just need to be less meaty and much more planty in our diets working into the future. But then obviously that does come with concerns about making sure that we get the right vitamins and minerals for growth and, and to maintain our health. Um, I thought there was a, an interesting piece of research that was, is happening at Rothamsted Research where they're trying to put genes from algae that are responsible for making omega-3 oils into uh, our crop plants. At the moment, we get our omega-3 from catching fish, cod liver oil. Fish oils famously have lots of omega-3 oils in them, but they, the fish get them inside them from algae. So if you can take the genes that mm -hmm. make omega-3 oils in algae and put it straight into the plants, then we can eat, we can harvest those plants and get our omega-3 and save the oceans at the same time. Which, so who'd have thought plant science would uh, help our, the biodiversity within our oceans? There we go. It's pretty cool. Uh, we have another question. Well, it's not so much a question, more oh. a comment. With such a wide-ranging topic, I wonder how they managed to select what they wanted to include. Really interesting. This is true. Uh, it was There's a whole world of plant science out there. There is a whole lot of plant science. It was quite good. I did enjoy how uh, they, all the students came together and they wrote down what they wanted, to, what they were interested in, what they wanted to make a video about. And then we did an exercise where we kind of paired them up thematically. So I think what is really nice is not, none of these students knew each other before they came to Rootstock. And by working together and making these videos, hopefully they've made this like really strong connection for life that will, they will then take forward into wherever they go next. Absolutely. Um, and we do have another question here. Um, so uh, a question from, that's come through from YouTube. Um, from Sierra Heisen Choi there. Uh, do you offer any programs for sixth formers at Gatsby? Always a tricky question um, as trying to get work experience in a lab. So um, we're just a uh, quick clarification. We are not, um, there is an organization called the Gatsby Charitable Foundation. They are our funders and we are the Gatsby Plant Science Education Program. Um, and we're called that because we're funded by Gatsby. And then we're also in the Sainsbury Laboratory at the University of Cambridge, which also receives core funding from Gatsby. Um, if you want to know more about finding out about how to get work experience, then there's information on that on the Plant Science Futures website, which you can see um, up on the bottom of the screen there. Thank you, Russell. Um, and um, so you can go there. There's information there. There's all sorts of information, careers information, actually. Um, on that site. Um, you can find out stuff about writing a CV, about how to 
how to go about getting work experience. So there are lots of plant science employers there. Can be difficult to get lab-based experience um, if you're a, a sixth former, but it's worth trying. It does happen. Um, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, do do make sure you, you go out and, uh, and look for that. Sure. Um, I will also say for sixth formers, specifically for sixth formers, there is a MOOC, a massive open online course, all about Agritech, which... Uh, the Gatsby Plant Science Education Program co-developed with uh, uh, EIUT Foods. EIT Foods. EIT Foods. I can never get that. Um, yes, uh, it's a three-week course. It's av available on the Future Learn platform right now, and uh, we've got it moderated, so you are able to interact with actual plant science researchers at the same time and ask them questions and have discussions with them as well. So yeah. definitely check that out. Great thing to pop in your uh, UCAS applications as well that you've done that course. Brilliant. Right. Moving on, we now have our next uh, video, uh, which is going to be, which I'm quite excited about. We have got uh, Aidan Smith and uh, Javi Cleverly, who are exploring hydroponics, a solution for the future. And afterwards, we're going to be chatting to Aidan Smith about making the video and why uh, they chose this project. Let's roll it. Have you ever wondered why food is so expensive? Part of that is because of transport costs. A way of addressing this is using uh, vertical farming. This makes use of derelict urban spaces whilst keeping your food costs low. This cuts down on water use, land use, whilst increasing yield. Now let's look at how it works. Vertical farming uses artificial growing environments within buildings. This can incorporate hydroponics, in which plants grow directly in a soilless, nutrient-enriched water solution. However, there are drawbacks to this system. One of which is the release of toxins by plants in the hydroponic system into the water, which reduce the growth of other plants. There is also a high release of methane from the hydroponic system. However, we propose the use of a bacteria which uses the methane and toxins as a fuel to release energy, which can be fed back into the hydroponic system. With the rising population, particularly in urban areas, increasing food production whilst bringing it into urban spaces will be crucial. Fantastic. Good talk about uh, hydroponics and kind of tying it back in to what Gareth Steed was talking about with vertical farming at the beginning of research. If you've just joined us, do wait till we finish and then rewind and go and watch what Gareth was talking about. Um, at the beginning of this. But I believe we are lucky enough to be joined by Aidan Smith, who was responsible for making that video. Well, hey, hello, Aidan, how's it going? Hello. I'm good, I'm good, I'm doing well. Brilliant, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. So, um, just, so we're curious as to um, how you came about choosing hydroponics. What, what was in it for you? What kind of made you bring this hydroponics idea to root stock and go on to make a video about it? Well, I think I'd always sort of had it in the back of my mind as I was aware of it. Um, and then I knew that sort of just generally there's a big squeeze on the amount of space we have for farming. So that coupled with an increasing population means we need to find ways of addressing um, how you can reduce space but increase yield um, to feed the population. So I think that was sort of the the start of the idea. And then I took that forward. Um, and then as I did more research on it, I found it was quite interesting and, it, and exciting sort of area um, of development. So I think that's, oh, sorry, I think that's how I got that. Ooh. Yeah, I was just yeah. gonna ask you, you said um, you already knew a bit about uh, hydroponics. Um, and I was gonna ask you what your, your journey towards um towards plant science has been so your degree is actually biochemistry so you didn't pick a plant science degree so um if you could tell us a bit more about how you how you uh, came to join us on rootstock i suppose well i think i've always been um curious about plants because my family go on a lot of walks so walking through the forest just looking at the world around you they're quite interesting, but I personally um, have never been too interested in sort of the phyl 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 
sorry, I can't say the word, but the structural side of it. So naming the different parts, I was more interested in sort of the biochemistry, um, like how, how they make the products that they do, how they can um, use light um, to produce, produce uh, carbon to make up uh, their cells and stuff. So I think I was interested in that side of it. And then I was sort of looking for ways to incorporate my biochemistry knowledge into plant science without doing like a whole degree about plants. So then I saw rootstock and I thought, well, this is very interesting. I'm in a good opportunity. And I had also been wanting to improve my sort of communication abilities because I've never been amazing at um, sort of expressing myself and being confident when talking to a group of people. So I thought I could tackle two birds with one stone, I guess. Fantastic. Well, you're doing a great job communicating now. <laughs> thank so you. thank you very much for uh, for joining us uh, again online today, Aidan. Um, and I think Aidan makes a really good point there that often we, we think of plants as this kind of special bit of biology. It's separate to animals. It's different to animals, different to bacteria. But actually, there's loads of biology and biochemistry and genetics and all these different things, evolution, ecology, all happening within plants. Um, and plants were a really exciting to, place, to an exciting way to, to study that, as Aidan has done, um, focusing his biochemistry on, uh, you know, on plants. Mm. So I think that's uh, always worth thinking about. Um, that, they're, uh, that plants make a great uh, model organism to work with and they're doing lots of amazing things that we still have to find lots, lots about. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think a plant is a great thing to experiment with because you can bypass a lot of the ethical considerations that you might have uh, if you were working with uh, animals. Or <laughs> there, indeed humans, yes. Yes, or indeed humans, there we go. So I guess kind of moving forward then, you're kind of uh, probably about halfway along your biochemistry journey. So what, yeah, where, what's, exactly. the, what's the future looking like? Um, well, I've got, so I've, I've um, made a, well, I haven't made it, but we've started a society at Sheffield called the Biotechnology and Pharmaceutical Engineering Society. And I was hoping to sort of, use that to um do more plant science kind of slash pharmaceutical outreach sort of tie the two together because i know there's a lot of where well, you can use plants as a a system for making um different antibiotic chemicals and i know there's been recent work into looking at uh the chemicals they produce to combat antibiotic resistance so sort of kind of going in that direction um and trying to couple my continued growth in biochemistry with a sort of eye on on plant science and how it can be applied there so um so yeah so that's sort of where i'm going and then after my degree i might do a phd so i could sort of tailor that to those interests and uh, yeah that sounds really interesting that i'm gonna have really to look cool. that up the <laughs> stuff about the antibiotic resistance um, that's going to be on my list of things to look up after we finish the broadcast um, and I think there are loads of people, lots of people are interested in a career that makes a difference, mm. in a career mm. that, um, that does something for human health. And people think, oh, I'll, well, I'll go and be a doctor or I'll be a dentist or um, I'll be a nurse and I'll work in a medical type profession mm. Um, mm. or that they'll work in, in pharmacology, but thinking that that will more involve humans. But actually, there's low. We, we talked earlier about the Madagascan periwinkle as well um, and its anti cancer properties. So there's loads that can be done. Um, so it's sat in lots of exciting ideas. I think lots of people are going to be really interested um, in that outreach you're going to be offering, Aidan. So that's, that's really exciting. Thank you. Phenomenal. Aidan, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Keep up the good work and best of luck on the rest of your biochemistry plant science journey. Thank you very much, and it's been wonderful talking to you too. Have a good day. Cheers. Bye. 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 So, ha, next up, I'm well excited now. We're going to get some live guests into the studio shortly. We have got a couple of researchers here from the Sainsbury Laboratory, and they do some amazing research. The video is called Tiny Robots to the Rescue. Now, this is the great thing because, again, plant scientists, you think, oh, they just grow plants. You'd never think that you would have to make tiny robots <laughs> to study plants. What amazing research. So this is, uh, this is 
This is a video by uh, Sarah Robinson, Ewan Smithers, Marwish Ejaz, and Lauren Weir, all based here in the Sainsbury Laboratory. And we will have, after this video, Ewan and Marwish uh, on the couch to be interviewed. Woohoo! Let's cue the video. 2023 is a scary time for us and our plants. This means our plants, including crops we rely on for food, are under increasing threat of winds, storms, rains. They all impose mechanical stress. All hope is not lost as we can build more resilient crops to the environmental stresses. To do this, we need to understand how they respond to mechanical stress. We have designed micro robots to recreate those stresses, such as stretching, squashing, and observe changes at the DNA level. With this, we can find the key genes which we can then target to produce happy and more resilient crops. This would also lay the foundation for more bio-inspired materials and the biofuel industry. Fantastic video there. I really enjoyed watching it being made because I, I just randomly walked in and Ewan uh, who we and Mawish, who we've got here in the audience with us, Ewan was on the floor behind a chair with these pipe cleaner things, like <laughs> waving them under the chair. And I was like, this video looks awesome. And it was, it was, uh, it was a really cool video. Uh, so could you talk, what was the experience for you guys taking part in Rootstock as researchers? I'm curious. I think it was really interesting, especially at the start, what you mentioned earlier about we all wrote down um, topics that interest us and we found that a lot of the researchers uh, they put down the topics that interested them loads of them didn't join up with the undergrads or you know, the young uh, were the non-researchers mm. and I feel like oh I've already learned something already that we're not communicating why our research is important you know right. we've, it's showed a yeah a, a gap already so was that because you were too specific in, in what you were looking to make a video about and, and the undergrads were, yeah, were broader? Like, what, what did you notice about that? Yeah, I think we were thinking too much what we were interested in and uh, we didn't look the broader uh, audience. Hmm. And then I think the, uh, what we learned from the workshop was really helpful and eventually then we understood how to approach the audience and it was really a good experience for us. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So I'm curious, can we, because you talked a little bit about these tiny robots and things like that, could you talk to us a little bit about your research that you're doing? And I, you kind of do slightly different things as well. So um, yeah, if we, if we could hear from you, like, hear a little bit about your research, I think that'd be really cool. Should we go first? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, in the group of Sarah Robinson, we are working on uh, plant growth and uh, mechanics. And uh, mechanics is very important for plant because, as you have seen in the video, uh, we have floods, wind, and uh, so plant needs mechanical strength. Uh, strength. And uh, so we are a very interdisciplinary team and we are uh, sharing uh, on uh, projects. As, for example, uh, my project is uh, aimed, we are, I am inducing cell divisions in plants. And uh, because uh, cell divisions are important for plants, uh, plants grow by uh, cell dividing, uh, dividing cells, and then uh, a fine balance between cell division and growth is needed. And then we look uh, how um, uh, the relationship between mechanics and cell division. And uh, Ewan is uh, uh, model modeling on <laughs> these experiments. If you yeah, so I'm a mathematician by background. Uh, so I use uh, mathematical modeling to then simulate um, like how these processes work. So I simulate the stretching of the plants from the robot and doing this can allow us to access inaccessible experimentally um, uh, parameters. So we can get insight into how these plants build big, large tissues, you know, how they can grow as tall as trees. Uh, we can uh, get more information and learn more core information. So that's, so that's phenomenal. So. These t so you talked a little bit about mechanics. So these robots, so and stretching 
So you're stretching individual plant cells, or? Yeah, no, we are stretching the tissues. Okay. Uh, so what I uh, earlier mentioned, like we are inducing cell divisions in um, this in individual cells, mm -hmm. and then in the tissue we have patches of dividing cells and non-dividing cells, and then we can use robot to uh, we mount this tissue and stretch, and we can compare the uh, dividing cells and the non-dividing cells and how their mechanical properties are different. Yeah, it's really fun experiment to do. <laughs> And then you go to you and, and you say, what if we did this, but it was 500 times taller? Or it's a 500 times, or that is that what, you know, it says, how can we take this further, or? Well, it's um, like a bit like, a bit of that, but also we can't, so plants feel like strain and stress, uh, and, and so we can only uh, stretch massive, like, you know, like these tissues, like the, mm. the embryonic stems. But I can look at the use my simulations. I could then look at what this does on the cell level. Uh, oh, so you go smaller rather than going. Oh, interesting. Yes. So like, are we? I can stretch uh, tissue, and then I can look at the cells. And so we can't access this information, um, but we can do it through simulations, which um, allows us to gain insights and then can drive further experiment, uh, further experiments. So if you did that experimentally, there's too much damage. But that also occurs. it helps like you and can first model and give us idea, okay, what if there is a smaller cell, we induce a cell division and there is a dividing cell and how mechanical patterns are different. And then we have a preliminary idea. And then, for example, then I can do an experiment inducing cell division by uh, inducing some cell division genes, for example. And then we can uh, compare our results of simulations and the experiments. Um, so that's how this modeling and experimental approach mm. together, it's really helpful. Otherwise, if I would be just doing experimentally and spending so much time on gene cloning and everything, and in the end, if uh, I don't get results, yeah. So uh, oh, it's really, really interesting how that, how those interact and mm. how those two different areas yeah. um, interact. And then obviously we've got, um, so are you a biologist? by yeah. background. Plant scientist. Uh, yeah. yeah, plant oh. scientist by background. So you've got a plant scientist by background, Marwish here, and then you've got Ewan who's come uh, through from, from maths. So we've got a whole, you know, a whole range of people moving into, um, into plant science from different areas. Um, another question um, via the Science and Plants for Schools channel. Um, for both of you, uh, what is your favourite part of your job? And can I say, and why? <laughs> I would say the community, my you know colleagues, you know like how science depicted quite often in the movies or you know in, uh, fictional work is that it's like a lone scientist who's doing everything and can do everything, but that's not how things are done. Discoveries are made by working with each other and through interdisciplinariness. That's how we make like uh, progress. <laughs> For me, I think I'd really like doing experiments with plants and uh, the genetics part because, uh, yeah, as you mentioned earlier as well, like in plants, doing genetics is so easy and you can cut different pieces of DNA, join them and can see effects and it's quite faster as well. And I love the, doing the experiments in the lab. <laughs> and uh, what's your least favourite part of your job? <laughs> Politely. <Ooh. laughs> Finding bugs in the code and <laughs> trying to debug the code. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's fair enough. So um, I'm curious as to, uh, you came on this rootstock and did this, this learnt about science communication. So as, as researchers, how important is the ability to communicate? Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's uh, really important for us, uh, so, uh, and especially when you are working in a very interdisciplinary team. We have uh, physicists, mathematics, and I'm plant scientist. And, and now I really put my conscious effort to explain or, yeah. So if you are working with different background, uh, and it's uh, uh, really important um, even to communicate uh, effectively. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I find it's really crucial. You can be doing the most awesome science, make the greatest of discoveries, but if you then can't communicate it well, that makes it accessible to other scientists or then accessible to the people funding you as well, then you won't be able to get your research out there and you won't be able to continue that research. Fantastic. Yeah, amazing. I think it's interesting you don't often think of scientists as communicators but it is such an inte mm. integral part of of the job and again links back to what Gareth was saying earlier about that 
that being really, really a key part of what he does as well mm. as a consultant. No, definitely. Um, we're going to keep uh, Ewan and Marish here. Um, but we are also going to be joined uh, oh. now by another person uh, from Rothamsted Research. Um, Rothamsted being um, a, we mentioned it in our first stream, but I'll mention it again, a not-for-profit um, research organisation that's focused on agricultural outcomes. Um, so we're joined by James Clark. Uh, James is Director of Communications and Engagement at Rothamsted. Welcome to the live stream, James. Um, Thanks. Great to be here. Great to be here. Fantastic. Um, and we'll keep uh, you and Amarwish here as well to answer a few questions. Um, we've got, brought James on today uh, to just ask you a few questions about things related to careers and studentship opportunities. Let, before we get any further, let's talk about studentship opportunities. Um, because I'm sure lots of people uh, watching this will be interested in, uh, in hearing what they can do uh, to uh, maybe explore a career in plant science a bit more. Sure. Well, I mean, obviously the opportunities come and go and uh, what will may be available when people watching this are searching for their PhDs may not be available now. But I think what's great about Rothamsted is, is, is partly the breadth of what we do. So obviously uh, a lot of plant sciences work, but tying that really into the agricultural side of things. The, the point about Rothamsted is to have impact in the real world. It's really to make a difference to agriculture and to farmers and to the food system as a whole. We've got to reform our food system. We've got to make it more sustainable. It's probably the major challenge facing humanity uh, over the coming decades. And that's what Rothamsted is all about because we are not just a research institute, we are also three farms. So if you're coming to do a PhD at Rothamsted, you're not just going to be in a lab, you're going to be on a farm. And that is the difference that we, we like to promote, is that we are the complete gene to field solution. I know that's easy to say, and many other institutes will probably claim exactly the same, but you know, you're walking out of the lab door and you're going to be actually in the fields with the tractors, with perhaps the plant that you are working on, the experiment that you are doing, going into the soil right next to your front door, as it were. Uh, so you've got that complete system all on three sites at the moment. So we've got a livestock farm down in the southwest. Now, I know that doesn't sound very planty, but in fact, uh, it's more about grassland systems and how we're going to basically use grassland systems in the future uh, to make them much more sustainable, much more climate friendly. So, yes, we're talking about livestock. We're also talking about food, the food for livestock. Uh, the grasslands, the, the grass swards on which livestock uh, uh, are reared. Now, obviously, there's a big debate around livestock as a whole in terms of climate change, but we're part of that debate. Uh, and you're going to be working across multiple disciplines. We have a social science uh, department just starting up now, asking farmers about what they're interested in, what is the kind of plant research that they can be uh, that they would like us to look at. So you're going to be embedded within the real world much more perhaps than, than in some other places. And I think that's what gives PhD opportunities at Rothamsted, uh, that extra bit of interest. You're going to be working with bioinformatics. One of the things that's unique about our farms is they're all wired up farms. We're going to create the world's first agricultural metaverse, TM Facebook, I know. But um, we want the entire system wide up. That is everything from the soil metabolomics, so everything that's going on in the soil, all the microbiome in the soil, the plants, how they're growing, how the roots are growing, how they're coming out of the soil. We've got a massive robotic phenotyping system uh, for new varieties of plants. Add in all the data about the weather, about the farming systems, about the ecology, about the interaction with the natural world. This is going to be we believe, a complete game changer for research in this country into agriculture. And I think that this is going to be what sets us apart. And you can be part of that so that you're not just working on your, your single research project. You are interlocking with massive streams of data, millions of points of data coming in from our farms and our other experiments that will enable us to change the entire farming system. Farming is incredibly complex. That's why you need uh, basically such a range of disciplines in order to investigate it properly. So that's what we're offering. Um, it's really tying plant science into real world impact. Um, 
I, I believe you know, we're world leaders in doing that. Many other people, of course, are doing great, great things. Uh, but I think at Rotham Stood, the opportunities are there. We are part of the UK uh, Centre for Doctoral Training on Food Systems with the University of Greenwich. We're part of Southwest Bio, which is the big Southwest PhD uh, scheme. We're part of Envision out of Lancaster University, looking at more agroecological approaches to farming. So we're, we're networked in with loads of other institutes, very strong links with the University of Nottingham as well, who have a very, very strong plant science base. And of course, with you guys, and of course, uh, with the guys in Norwich, um, it, it's a very, uh, it, it's a very, very collaborative place to work. So uh, that was a very, very long answer. The, I do uh, apologize. No, no. Just going to say, I think we'll all be off to work at Rothamsted. I yeah. think that after that, we're going to be, um, that sounds amazing, James. And I was really struck by the different opportunities are there. You're talking about PhD opportunities, but this idea of like linking up um, in this, this agricultural metaverse, there are jobs there for, for technicians, people building that equipment, um, people working in professional services and support services to make these things happen. Um, and technicians being a really key part of that. We had Tash on earlier, who of course is a technician at Rothamsted. And um, I think it's really important to, to say that to have a career in plant science um, or a career related to plants, you don't need to be an academic researcher. There are great opportunities being an academic researcher, yeah. but there are also really important things. The people who um, you know, work with um, the microscopes here, for example, at, um, at SLCU, at the Sainsbury Laboratory, sorry, um, the, you know, they, they get to work with these amazing bits of, bits of kit and, they really, and they're really proud of that, really mm. love what they do. They get to be involved on, on creating scientific papers uh, for people, um, uh, with people as well. Mm. So there, there's a huge involvement um, in that. And even if you've got these interests in social science or, in, you mm. know, or indeed in working with animals, you can still contribute to, to plant science mm. as well. And I think going back, we talked about thinking about what you want from your career there was fun fulfillment and finance that gareth mentioned and i think it's really you know it shows that what you've described there james is a is a an organize an organization that can fulfill that yeah. and a career option that can fulfill that yeah. so thank you yeah we, i, I totally agree with, i totally agree with, sorry no 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 I, I was go for it sorry james go for i it. totally agree about the technician route we've had technicians going all the way to phd uh, joining uh, because they enjoy you know, actually doing the, the, the science, but getting more and more into it as they go. And it's been uh, you know, an incredibly rewarding path for them. So I was curious to draw upon something that Marwish said, which is about the multidisciplinariness and the importance of communication, communicating with that. And that's within your own research group. And clearly, James, you've got a lot of people to communicate with loads of, I'd say, probably quite a, a much broader demographic of stakeholders, farmers, uh, academic institutions, things. But you're also director of communications and engagement. So I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about the importance of communication, uh, communicating what you do to the different stakeholders. Well, I mean, if you don't communicate, you don't have impact. I and mean, that's we want our science to make a difference. And I think most people. Who, who come into to science and particularly things like plant science, you're there because you want to make a contribution that, that will have an impact in the, in the real world ultimately. Um, and if, if you just put it in a scientific journal, yes, a few academic, you know, a few academic colleagues will read it. But if you want to have impact, you have to take it off the page and you have to communicate it. And I think it is so important. I, I think the change that I've seen over the time that I've been doing this is there are so many exciting tools now for you to actually do that yourself we used to you know have to rely on the media coming to us before we could get our messaging out we don't have to do that anymore the the tools uh, at your disposal to create the superb videos we've seen today i mean absolutely tremendously creative videos we've seen today are just a really really good example if you don't want to make a video write a blog do a, do an animation um uh, do a local face-to-face -face event uh, we're very, very uh, keen on doing those kind of events here at Rotham. So again, it's a, another good reason to do a PhD here. For instance, we do New Scientist Live every year. So that's the UK's biggest science show in London. 23,000 people over three days. Uh, we did it on chemical, chemical ecology 
uh, this year. So that was all about the organic chemicals, the volatile organics that plants give off that we could actually use to move away from artificial pesticides and actually use smells and fragrances to try and control the pests that are attacking our crops. Um, we put that to the to the research group. They came up with the most creative display with lots of perfumes and things for people to smell uh, and games they could play uh, about you know what, what attracted insects and what repelled insects. So it was a huge opportunity to think creatively about in that face-to-face -face situation, how do you engage people uh, and get them talking about your science? And the public really want to know. I, and this is, I think, the other big change is that there used to be, I guess, an attitude that science is just, it's just too hard. Uh, I, I can't deal with it. Uh, but actually, I think the audience now is completely different. People really want to know what science can do for us. Uh, and to a certain extent, they expect scientists to be able to explain themselves. Well, they are, of course, paid for by the taxpayer in many cases, um, so particularly in our case. So I think we have a duty to go to the public and tell them what we do. And I think in return, they challenge us. They challenge us. They give us feedback. Uh, we found it an intensely rewarding experience for all of our researchers, that public engagement piece. But also we do that with farmers as well, uh, particularly in the agroecology side. There's a kind of Glastonbury of farming called Groundswell uh, that takes place every year. And um, uh, lots of tents and <laughs> living in fields. And it is the, I think this is where the change is going to happen. Young, innovative farmers really keen on agroecology. They love their plants. They love their fields. They want to make change in the system and they want our science to support that. And those exchanges, I mean, when you see the enthusiasm there and the engagement, the levels of engagement with our scientific teams, it's just such a tremendous experience for both parties. And that's how science needs to advance in concert, you know, in, in lockstep, really, with the public and the users of science, in our case, uh, the farming community. So, we, you know, we're we recognize communication as a central part of what we do. Absolutely fantastic. So what I'd like to do, we're going to need to wrap up shortly, but what I would love is if you've got one message to the plant scientists of the future out there, the audience, what would you say to them? I think I would say like plant sciences has, uh, can have a huge impact. Uh, and especially, I think, working uh, in plant sciences, I can connect to more people uh, compared to if I would be just working on a specific disease. And, um, and also then you can decide uh, which uh, the area you would like to work, whether you want to, be, you can be a mathematician and you can still be a plant scientist or a biologist. And this is also important what you love to do uh, day to day uh, basis. And, I was going to say, Ewan, why should all mathematicians come and work in plant sciences? <laughs> um, because they're wonderfully complex and we have no idea of how they work a lot of times. So, yeah, they're a lot of fun <laughs> to research. I guess it's that three, the three Fs, the fun, fulfilment and the finance. There we go. And who, yeah, plant sciences. And yeah, and so, uh, yeah, James, if you could, yeah, what, in passion, plea to the plant scientists of the future. <laughs> This is, this is the best time ever, I think, to have become a plant scientist. We're just starting to see a rollback on gene editing and, and GM. It's going to open up incredible new ways to find out what plants do and how they do it. There's never been a better time to be a plant scientist. Uh, older plant scientists say they are deeply envious of younger plant scientists coming into the field now because it's, the change is going to be massive. And it's absolutely critical for humanity that we do it now and that we get those talented scientists out there and making a real difference in the world. I think Amazing. that's, that's awesome. Plea. I'm Fantastic. going to high five all of you guys for being yeah. awesome. And yes, these are virtual high fives. There's one for you, James. Um, <laughs> there we go. So uh, at the bottom of the screen there, uh, we talked a little bit about it earlier. Uh, which is the MOOC, which is on the FutureLearn platform at the moment. It's live all the time, so you can go and do it whenever you like. But right now, like I said, we've got actual plant scientists from across the UK moderating it. So you can ask questions, you can have discussions with them over the next three weeks. Um, it's a great course. I did it myself. 
I really, really enjoyed it and learned loads from it. So I'd strongly recommend checking that out. And if you're watching this after the live stream's gone out, we will leave a link at the bottom down there in the editing bits underneath and you can click on it and you can go through and you can do a three week Agritech course. Amazing. It's amazing stuff. Um, I think we're basically at the end of our course. We're going to have one more video um, just to celebrate Rootstock. Um, I just want to say thank you very much to James for coming along. Thank you for your time today. Thank you to Ewan and to Marwish. Um, I will also say uh, thank you to our funders, the Gatsby Charitable Foundation. Thank you to um, Siren Calling, who we worked with on this event. Uh, thank you to the Royal Society of Biology, um, to Fuse School, who joined us earlier, um, and also to Rothamsted uh, Research, particularly um, for enabling us to also go out live on their YouTube channel. Mm. Um, you will find this recording later on the Gatsby Plant Science Education Programme YouTube channel. We will have added all of the links. Um, so you can re-watch if there's anything that you missed. Um, don't forget to go to Plant Science Futures, uh, the website. It's uh, there. You can't there see it. Us. There it is. It's down there. It's there. 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 It's so there responsive. It um, that, uh, plant science, don't forget to go to Plant Science Futures to find out more about plant science careers, how you can um, get there. There's advice on writing a CV. There's advice on finding placements. There's a great big list of plant science employers, and there's also some really great articles. I would say that I wrote one of them um, about um, <laughs> <laughs> about uh, why a career in plant science is really exciting and what are the exciting mm. things happening with plants at the moment. Do also, um, if you are involved in uh, schools education, check out the Science and Plants for Schools website, which is saps.org.uk. Um, and there you'll find loads of freely available resources for supporting, teaching lots of different areas of biology through plants. Well, hey, there it is. There it is. Look at that. And there Go think... behind the scenes, team. Wait. We could just say anything and maybe it will appear on the screen. There we go. Uh, um, anyway, before let's... Russell says okay. anything, um, we're going to finish up. So. We Let's go. Thank you very much, Russell. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you very much, Marish, Ewan, all the team behind the scenes, Josh, Ian, and the, is that Sarah and Dan? Yes. Thank um, you, everyone. Claire and Jamie, thank you very much. Claire and Jamie. Um, a final video from Olivia Franzak, why I recommend Rootstock. Bye. Hi everyone, um, my name is Olivia and I was one of the attendees of the 2023 Rootstock at Cambridge and it was absolutely amazing. I can't recommend it enough. It was so, so fun um, being around other plant scientists and people that just have a general interest in it and want to be there um, and the amount of people we got to meet and the amount of cool people we got to meet as well was really good. Um, I think one of my highlights was definitely going around um, the the facilities and looking at the herbarium and the um, the greenhouses, which were really really cool. Um, like especially the different measures that they have to take um, to make sure like all the genetically modified stuff is contained. Um, so yeah, it was honestly really really interesting and. Um, I would very much recommend it like if you can do it do it um because it is so worth it and it's definitely an experience that I won't be forgetting anytime soon and I'm glad that I was able to take part in it I consider myself very fortunate so yeah thank you so much to the team that organized it and yeah take part if you can <laughs>